Welcome everybody, Brother Dan Goodwin here, your host on the God's Final Jubilee program. And tonight we're going to be sharing uh, with you about the topic, the two candlesticks of Revelation. There are two candlesticks of the book of Revelation. What I'm going to be sharing with you, some of, some of what I'm going to talk about tonight is in the book, The Revelation, the study guide that I've written. If you don't have that, you might want to check that out on the website, godsfindjubilee.com. Um, in fact, there's more in here that I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, there's a whole section in the back of here that talks about who gets saved and when during the tribulation. Who can be saved and when? A whole page there uh, with scriptures talking about who gets saved first during the tribulation and uh, and when when they get saved. There's also um, a chapter in the Mystery of the Jubilee book concerning these two candlesticks, uh, the two witnesses that I'm going to be talking about tonight. In this book, this very important book, The Mystery of the Jubilee. So if after you get done listening, you'd like to have more, uh, those two books would be of interest to you uh, on the website. All right, but we're going to talk tonight about the two candlesticks of Revelation. This is actually an article that I wrote that's going to come out in the Prophecy News Magazine. I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to skim it for you. Um, but uh, I want to talk about, let me read for you Revelation chapter 11 real quickly. Revelation chapter 11 uh, and verse 3 and 4 says this, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now that's twelve hundred and sixty days. Those of you that understand the timelines of the book of Revelation and other places understand that three and a half years is in fact 1260 days on the Hebrew calendar, on the calendar that God uses, I should say. The 360 uh, day calendar. Okay, so three and a half years, 1260 days, half of the tribulation. And, uh, and it says here, it goes on to say, clothed in sackcloth, in other words, mourning. Um, these are the two olive trees. Now there's a, a sign there or a, a, a clue as to who they are. They're not olive trees, literally, obviously. These are two men. And it goes on, it says, And the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Um, we also read about these guys in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4. I'm not going to read that for you, but Ze Zechariah, chapter 4, I think it's verses 3 through 12. And they're called the two candlesticks. All right, these are two men. Um, if you read commentaries and or online Bible searches, you will discover that there is much confusion about the two witnesses that minister to Israel during the tribulation. A lot of confusion out there. You ask four different guys, you'll, you'll get five different answers, right? Um, so you're going to have to decide what you believe. I'm going to tell you what I believe, and I'm going to tell you somewhat why I believe it now. I can't give it all to you. If you get the books, you'll you'll get um, you'll get a lot more information in the books that I'm going to give you tonight. But um, let me uh, let me share with you here. Um, if you read commentaries or online Bible searches, you will discover that there is much confusion about the two witnesses. Uh, there are many differing opinions as to who they are, when they show up, and what they do. So three things: who they are when they appear on the earth, and what their purpose is. Those three things. I want to shine a light tonight on the mystery of these two candlesticks, or witnesses as we call them. They appear in the Transfiguration in Matthew 17, which actually is a very important passage of the Bible, uh, because it says after six days he takes Peter, James, and John up apart into a mountain to pray. Now six days, of course, symbolic, uh, prophetic of 6,000 years. So around the 6,000 year mark, God is going to take the church out and the two witnesses are going to come down. In fact, they're named, aren't they, in Matthew 17? Who are they? It's not, it's not Enoch, is it? It's Moses and Elijah. I am convinced they are the two witnesses, the two candlesticks of Zechariah chapter 4 and uh, Revelation chapter 11. Okay, and I believe they show up at the beginning of the tribulation. And I believe they die at the middle, okay? Uh, why two witnesses? Why not one? Why not three? Well, because Deuteronomy 19 says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or, or, or any sin, uh, but out of the mouth of two witnesses 
or three witnesses, it goes on to say. So there's got to be at least two witnesses before something can be heard uh, in a courtroom. Um, their purpose, what is their purpose? Their purpose is to proclaim the truth to Israel after the church is taken out. After the saints are taken off the earth, the purpose of the two witnesses is to preach and testify to the nation of Israel what they, what they have seen, what they've heard, and what the truth is about the Messiah. Their, their ministry is exactly three and a half days, 42 months, 1260 days long, three and a half years, 42 months. Okay, and then they're going to be killed by the Antichrist, they're left in the street for three and a half days, then they, got, they get up and they ascend back to heaven, and that's when the 144,000 Jewish men who witnessed that are going to become believers. Now that's the story in a nutshell right there. These two candlesticks will be the only light on the whole earth during the first half of the tribulation. They will be hated by everyone and will be killed by the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation. I believe he kills them on Passover. And I believe if I, if I had you in my office with, uh, with my Bible and some paper and a pen, I believe I could show you this. Uh, in my books, I believe I do show this, but uh, um, it's a little complicated to do you know, without you sitting here without a piece of paper um, and reasoning with it. But I believe I can prove to you these guys are killed on Passover. They ascend back to heaven on the third, after three and a half days, or the third day, the same day Christ rose from the grave, Feast of First Fruits. And, uh, and the two witnesses, they're left dead in the street for the whole world to see. The whole world rejoices that they are dead. There is not, there is not one saved person on the world, on the earth, when the two witnesses die and when they ascend back to heaven. How do we know that? There's a whole bunch of reasons why, but I, I don't have time to give them all to you. But uh, one reason is the whole world rejoiced when they were killed. Everybody on planet Earth is happy. They gave gifts one to one to another. They're, they're rejoicing when the two witnesses are killed. They're happy. It uh, doesn't say all the lost uh, rejoice. It said all the people on the Earth, the whole world. Okay? Um, this is the same day Christ arose, some 2,000 years earlier. I believe this is when the 144,000 Jews assembled in Jerusalem for Passover trust in the Messiah. And by the way, they're there because they have to be there. All you Jewish men, if you're under the Old Testament now, all you Jewish men of age have to be in Jerusalem the evening of Passover at 6 p.m. for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You're commanded to be there, okay? And that's why I have, I have a... I have a theory why there's 144,000, uh, but that's, I'll save for another time, okay? Um, this is the time period the Bible calls uh, the, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, this is the great tribulation, right at the second half. This is where it begins, the time of Jacob's trouble, because after the Jews get saved, after the 144,000 become believers, because it says in Re Revelation 11, I think it's verse 13, it says, The remnant gave glory to the God of heaven. When? When the two witnesses ascend back to heaven. Moses and Elijah get up. They go back to heaven in the sight of everybody, just like Jesus did at the ascension. They rise bodily back to, uh, back to heaven. And that's when the Bible says the remnant, which I believe is 144,000 men, the remnant gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, my friend, a lost man cannot give glory to the God of heaven. I believe that's the conversion of the 144,000. I believe that's where they get saved, right there at the middle of the tribulation. Okay, now I'm headed somewhere here. Don't leave. Don't leave. All right, this is, uh, so what happens then? They get saved. They're, they're assembled in Jerusalem for unleavened bread. They trust in the Messiah at the, at the resurrection of these two men. They, uh, they do so after witnessing this amazing event. The Antichrist becomes furious, breaks the seven-year peace treaty, uh, declares war on the Jews who run for their lives, and that's Matthew 24. This is the time period the Bible calls the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the great tribulation, we call it. The mar See, the, there's the tribulation of seven years, 2,520 days, but it's also... Uh, there's also a portion that's called the Great Tribulation, and that's the time that is, that is uh, bad for Israel. That's the second half. See, Israel's at peace for the first half, but not the second half. The sec second half, they're running for their lives. And those 144,000 are going to be God's witnesses. It's going to be the book of Acts for three and a half years. Those witnesses, those 144,000 are going to flee 
and they're going to lead people to Jesus, to the Messiah, um, throughout their, their, their running for their lives, okay? Just like the book of Acts. Um, all right? If you understand the harvest, there are three phases to the harvest, first fruits, main harvest, gleanings, right? The first fruits is the first crop of the garden. That's another evidence that these guys are the first people saved in the tribulation because that's what they're called. They're called, and I believe I have the passage here, they're called the first fruits under God. Revelation chapter 14 verse 4 says this, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whether swear we goeth. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. These 144,000, I believe, are the first people saved. They're called the first fruits. The first people saved during the tribulation. I can prove to you they're saved right at the middle of the tribulation. This is important, folks. Um, <clears throat> so, since they are the first fruits of the harvest during the tribulation and are not saved until the middle of the tribulation, then there are no then that obviously there are no converts during the entire first half of the tribulation. Now, that's a shocking statement, friend. Um, very few people understand this. Uh, very few prophecy teachers and preachers understand what I just said. I believe there's nobody saved until the middle of the tribulation. All right. Um, no converts during the entire first half. And by the way, this is a very sobering truth because 50% of the world's population will die in the first half of the tribulation. One-fourth dies during the first four horsemen of the tribulation, the first four seals. Uh, a quarter of the world dies right there. And by the time you get to the to the second, by the time you get to the middle of the tribulation, another quarter, half the world dies in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, and they're all lost and they all go to hell when they die. That's sobering, my friend. Um, all right, that could be uh, three to four billion people, depending on how many people are saved and they go in the rapture. Right? What is there? Eight billion people right now. How many people are saved? We don't know. Um, that means uh, there's a whole lot of people going to die and go to hell um, during the uh, first half of that tribulation period. There's nobody saved on the first half. Friends, some of these lost souls will be your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your friends, your cousins. Um, think about that. This is a sobering thing. This is nothing to laugh about. This is nothing to rejoice about. Um, th this is serious stuff. This is judgment. This is the wrath of God upon this world. Um, so, the mystery of the tribulation, saints. It is a terrible thought to consider that no souls are saved in the first half of the tribulation. By the way, in the Revelation study guide, I give a whole page, as I, as I mentioned, about who gets saved and when during the tribulation with scriptures. A whole page, I, I deal with that. I talk about it a little bit also in the mystery of the Jubilee book. Um, uh, but I think, I think if you've got a question about this, if you're not convinced yet what, about my statement that nobody saved the first half, I believe, I, believe I, can, I believe it's proved beyond any shadow of a doubt. By the way, nobody has ever refuted my statement. Now, there's people who maybe don't teach the way I do and disagree, but nobody has ever refuted my belief and my statement that nobody saved on the first half. Nobody's ever shown me anybody in the Bible getting saved on the first half. Now I've shown you that the 144,000 are saved, or they're, they're, uh, they are they're give glory to the God of heaven right at the middle of the tribulation on Feast of First Fruits. And I've proved to you um, that I believe that that's when they get saved. And the Bible says they're the first fruits unto God. Now, I've given evidence, scriptural evidence, that they are the first people saved. Now, if you disagree with me, you better give me some scriptural evidence for somebody getting saved other than them during the first half of the tribulation. I know there's books out there and people talk about it, but uh, better you better be able to back up what you say with the Word of God. Now, very quickly here, um, it is a terrible thought to consider no souls are saved during the first half. I, I give seven statements here, and I'll just read them briefly. Number one, God does have a deadline that cannot be crossed. God has a deadline. There, there is a timeline. If you're going to get saved, you've got to get saved on God's clock, not yours. Um, 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is very plain here, especially verses 11 and 12, talking about the strong delusion that God will give those who rejected His Son. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, Many shall be purified, made white, and tried, and the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. There's a deadline. God shuts a door, and that door can never be opened again. Okay, there's a lot more to it than that, but... Uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 24 through 33, talks about this, this, this deadline where God shuts a door. Number two, all believers are gone at the rapture. So who's going to lead people to Jesus if all believers are gone at the rapture? That's right, nobody. And by the way, I do not believe the angel that everybody talks about with the everlasting gospel. I do not believe that that's talking about the angel preaching. Now, I realize most people disagree with me on this. They don't really disagree. They've just never, they've never saw my side of this. Um, they they read that verse and they jump to the conclusion that an angel is coming down to the earth and that angel is going to preach the gospel. No, he's not. Nowhere in the Bible did an angel ever lead anybody to Jesus Christ. Now, angels were they had their purpose and they brought messages to the two people. They brought a message to Mary. They brought messages to Daniel. Nowhere in the Bible, in fact, just the opposite. In, a, in Acts chapter ten. Remember Cornelius is praying and fasting and he wants to be saved? Remember the angel showed up? Did that angel lead Cornelius to the Lord? No, sir. How come? Because it's not his job. Angels are not saved. They're not born again. It's not their job. Uh, God chose born again, redeemed people to lead other people to redemption. And uh, the angel said, go get Peter. He'll tell you how to be saved because he's experienced it. Okay, so... Uh, if you don't agree with me, that's fine, but I've given you some scriptural evidence there to consider, okay? Um, so I think what the Bible says about the angel coming down with the everlasting gospel, I think God is just saying that the word of God is delivered again to the saved upon the earth at that time, and those saved are going to take that word of God and, and, and go across the world with it. it. I don't believe he's saying the angel preaches it. I believe he's saying the angel brings it to the earth, to the 144,000, and they go out and they preach the Word of God, okay? Um, so all believers are gone. We have been, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, God has put us in trust with the gospel. Not angels, us, the redeemed, are, have been put in trust with the gospel. Romans 10, 14, How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Not an angel, a preacher. So, uh, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, and uh, boy, I got a whole bunch of verses here in the article uh, and in the books uh, that deal with the fact that God uses man to, to, God uses the redeemed to bring redemption to the world, okay? Number three, consider the open rejection of people during the tribulation who refuse to trust Christ, Revelation 6, Revelation 9, and other places where people mock and say, hide us from the wrath of him, from the Lamb. Why don't they get saved? Because they're not under conviction. God's not drawing them to salvation. This is the tribulation period. Now, will there be people saved? Sure. We started out, I, I told you, the 144,000 are going to be saved. It's been foretold. It's been prophesied. They're going to lead countless multitudes of others to salvation. Most are going to be martyred. But that doesn't happen till the middle of the tribulation. Number four. We hear about the 140,000 Jews who are the first ones saved during the tribulation, and I've already talked about that. Number five, everything on earth, everyone on earth rejoices at the death of God's two witnesses, proving that there's nobody saved because the whole world rejoices in the death of Moses and Elijah. Number six here, Revelation 13, verses 1 through 8, is clearly speaking of the middle of the tribulation. And um, you compare that with Revelation 12, Revelation 9. The 144,000 getting saved are clearly the middle of the tribulation. I don't have time to read all those. <clears throat> um, let's see. And lastly, Revelation 6, uh, chapter uh, verses 9 through 11 are the church age saints, while Revelation 6, 11 are the tribulation martyrs. Let me close with this real quickly. And I don't, I don't have time to give this justice. Um, the only passage anybody could ever show me claiming there are people saved during the, tr the first half of the tribulation is Revelation 6, 
verses 9 through 11. When he'd opened the fifth seal, I saw into the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice. These are these saints that have uh, uh, gone to heaven and uh, have been martyred. Um, trying to refresh that thing. Here we go. Um, so, they were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now let me explain this. People jump to the conclusion that these are, these are people who died during the first half of the tribulation. In fact, during the very beginnings of the tribulation. Now, here's, here's the problem with that. These guys are crying out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on those that dwell on the earth? You mean to tell me there's been people for 2,000 years that have been martyred, and they've been in heaven for 2,000 years? These guys just got there five minutes ago, and they're crying out, How long, O Lord, before you avenge us? No, sir. You know what, who these are talking about? He tells us who they're talking about. And when he'd opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Who are these guys? These are the people during the last 2,000 years of the church age. These are the church age martyrs who've been in heaven, some of them for 2,000 years, some of them for 1,500 years, some of them for 300 years, you know, whatever. They've been there. And they're crying out, okay, Lord, how long before you avenge our blood on those that dwell on the earth? How long, O oh Lord? Um, and that's what's going on here. And uh, now what's going on with my screen, I don't know, but I'm, uh, I'm working on it here. These guys have been there a long time. These are the church aid saints, and at the fifth seal, they're, they're, they're pointed out. Hey, look at these guys. Wrath is coming upon the earth. That's what part of this is about. This is God's wrath upon the earth for the treatment of the saints that God had uh, left on the earth to reach people with the gospel and the, the world and has, 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 has martyred them and killed them. And now you turn to Revelation 17, you'll see another group of, of saints that white robes is given to. And uh, John says, uh, or they said, who are these? And, he, and John says, thou knowest. And he said, these are they who have, uh, have washed their robes and have been, they, these, are, these are those who have been martyred. So Revelation 6 is the church age saints who have been there for some of them 2,000 years. Revelation 7, there's your martyrs during the tribulation. When does that take place? During the second half. You also read about the 144,000 in Revelation 7. By the way, Revelation 7 is not in order. It's a parenthetical chapter stuck in there to explain a future event that's going to happen during the tribulation. Okay? All explained in, in, in great detail in, in these two books. Uh, if, you're still, if you're still confused or you'd like to get further uh, information on some of this, this, this article is going to come out in the Prophecy News magazine in a couple of months. And uh, So let me close with this. The Bible says in Corinthians, Now, behold, now is the day of salvation. You put off salvation, my friend, and you, uh, you, you, you are here after the rapture takes place. If you can be saved, you're going to have to live through the entire first half of the tribulation before you have a chance to be redeemed. The first people saved are the 144,000 Jews, and then they're going to scatter and they're going to reach people. If, uh, so if you think you're going to get saved during the tribulation, good luck with that. Let me tell you something. Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. You better get saved while you can. You've been listening to the God's Final Jubilee program. I'm your host, Evangelist Dan Goodwin. Uh, find us, uh, make sure you uh, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel or make sure you go to the, find us on Facebook, God's Final Jubilee Facebook page. We do live streaming there. You can find me at Prophecy News. I'm the host at Prophecy News TV. Just go to prophecynews.com. Find their YouTube channel and uh, I, uh, or find listings for the TV programs in your area. And I uh, hope I've been a help to you tonight. I know I, I went kind of fast and I, I kind of skimmed it. I didn't plan to spend a whole hour and give you the whole thing. So 
Um, but I hope I've given you enough to at least whet your appetite, make you want to learn more and study for yourself, okay? Good to see you all. We'll catch you all next time.